This aircraft, the Curtis P-40, the Kitty Hawk, I owe my life in the sense that it brought my father, a young Australian fighter pilot, home safely after countless missions against the Japanese war machine. Australians first flew Kitty Hawks in defense of their country in its darkest hour, that terrifying time between the fall of Singapore and the Battle of the Coral Sea. This is the story of those pilots who against all the odds held the line in New Guinea for 44 crucial days until the Americans arrived. It's a story, I guess, of how Australians did fight for their country when nobody else would. The Japanese military juggernaut, which surged south after the attack on Pearl Harbor, seemed unstoppable. Each disaster for the Allies brought the war closer to Australia. Hong Kong surrendered on December the 25th. The Philippines fell just a week later. And less than a fortnight after that, the paralyzing loss of Singapore. In mid-February, Darwin was bombed for the first time. Then the Japanese seized Rabaul and invaded New Guinea itself at Leh. The war was now, quite literally, on Australia's doorstep. Here at Parliament House, the Prime Minister, John Curtin, was consumed with fear for his country in what he called our darkest hour. He realised that the key to Australia's survival would be air power. The RAAF was commanded by a British officer and took its orders from the Air Ministry in London. At the beginning of 1942, incredibly, Australia had no frontline fighter squadron operating from its own soil. The brutal truth, never faced by Menzies or Fadden, was just beginning to dawn on Curtin. Hitler came first. If it came to the crunch, Australia was expendable. But the Prime Minister fought back. He bombarded Churchill and Roosevelt with fresh demands for fighter aircraft. Give us Kitty Hawks, he cries in a stream of top secret cables. He repeats it relentlessly. Give us Kitty Hawks. Washington says, but if we gave you Kitty Hawks, would Australia have the pilots to fly them? Australia, Curtin replies, has the pilots to fly any number of Kitty Hawks that are likely to become available. Only a few of the original pilots who answered Curtin's call to arms survived today. For the most part, they were ordinary men who would be called upon to perform extraordinary deeds. Peter Masters, from the staid middle class of pre-war Adelaide. He'd been training to be a diplomat, but ended up earning the nickname Poison Pete through his insidious pursuit of the Japanese Zero. Alan Wetters joined the squadron as a 30-year-old veteran. The other pilots, 10 years younger, promptly dubbed him Grandad Wetters. Arthur Tucker, was a Queensland Bush school teacher who joined up at 20. His call sign was Friar, but he had little time to convert, from shooting rabbits with a 303 to handling the Kitty Hawks machine guns. Bill Dean Butcher hadn't even completed his hospital training before enlisting and being posted as 75 Squadron's doctor. After the war, he became a distinguished eye surgeon and unofficial historian of the Squadron's early days. John Piper was selling carpets in Melbourne at the outbreak of war. He'd win a distinguished flying cross for his bravery in the skies over Port Moresby. Jack Pettit left school at 15 to work at radio station 2UE in Sydney, but his ambition was always to fly. He applied to join the Air Force the day after war was declared. Bob Crawford, a youngster from Dulwich Hill, had always wanted to drive taxis. 50 years later, he owns his own cab and still drives a few shifts every week. Mick Butler, a boy from the bush who just wanted to fly aeroplanes. Today, he's happy in his retirement 
still managing to send down the odd bowl at his local club. Crawford and Butler forged a special friendship, flying Kitty Hawks together in the RAAF. Half a century later, their mateship and their memories endure. It was the adventure spirit and king and country, if you, you'd like to put it that way, and uh, I went in with uh, my ears back. And uh, not sorry, not sorry. I'm one of the very fortunate ones that survived the war uh, intact. And I, I, I still say that uh, my prime object was, was to fly an aeroplane. That's uh, you know, right or wrong. I, I, I didn't consider the army or maybe the navy a little bit. So I've always wanted to fly aeroplanes. And I, I never really gave it a thought. Yeah, we, we, we were, if we were told to do something, you did it, and you didn't question. By March of 1942, Curtin's Kitty Hawks had finally arrived. Ironically, we only got them because the war in the Pacific was going so badly. The Americans had sent 75 planes in crates to Java, but that island fell before the convoy could land. So these precious P-40s were diverted for assembly in Sydney. A special new unit, 75 Squadron, was formed to fly them. It was immensely stable, and uh, it was a tremendous gun platform. Mm. The uh, six 50mm uh, Browning guns were really destructive. It could take an awful lot of punishment, and as we saw someone come home with holes you could crawl through, yet it still seemed to stick in the air. And uh, the air at the engine, which I had the experience, I think could take an awful belting. And, you know, you could over abuse it with high revs and, uh, you know, it get hot for a long time, but it still kept going. A very heavy machine, very strong. Uh, it was something we'd never experienced before. Um, it was from the power that it had. It had a magnificent uh, firepower. It had a range. Uh, it uh, had a very reliable engine in the Allison. And uh, it, it was a wonderful you know, war horse. The IAAF now had the planes and the men to fly them, but they were still far from being an operational unit. The pilots had virtually no training hours on the Kitty Hawk and their aircraft was still 2,000 miles from the front line. Clearly, it would need a commander of rare quality to turn 75 Squadron into an effective fighting unit. By sheer good fortune, one of Australia's best airmen was home on leave from his squadron in the Western Desert. At 34, John Jackson was the oldest fighter pilot in the RAAF. John's hot-headed younger brother, Les, had also enlisted in the Air Force so John arranged for him to be transferred to the new Kitty Hawk squadron. Old John, as he was known, came from a prosperous grazing family who owned sheep stations and a motor business in southern Queensland. He'd married in Adelaide before the war, but his two young children had to make do with brief visits from their father when he was home on leave. A big, balding man of few words, John Jackson was hardly the classic image of a fighter ace, yet it would be this cryptic Queenslander who led two dozen youngsters into battle against the air aces of Japan. He was a man you'd follow. Um, he wasn't a Clark Gable. As uh, many Americans there were, uh, they were personality guys and great flyers too. But John was a big, ambling country fellow who uh, just exuded confidence gave everybody confidence. He led from the front. Um, he had a very convincing, deep voice, and people felt they could trust him. Oh, well, he was just a tough old nut, I think, but also a very human man. And I think he had... Um, he didn't have a very, uh, really outgoing personality, but he, I think everybody thought that he was a very good bloke, and he put in thoroughly himself. Uh, you know, I feel 
uh, greatly for anyone who had to put together and command a squadron made up as it was of people who were so uh, completely untrained and so incoherent. The squadron's first problem was to get its planes from Sydney, where they were being assembled, to this field outside Townsville, 1,200 miles to the north. Now, these boys had barely any experience of flying Kitty Hawks. At that stage, they had no radio, let alone any radar. Yet, quite recklessly, they were ordered to ferry their planes north. Above Newcastle, the storms struck. The weather w wasn't good, and uh, so it was necessary to point out that we hadn't flown uh, formation, let alone uh, done any cloud flying. Had you ever been in the cloud with the Kitty Hawk? No. We had no radio, there was nothing I could do for the other fellow, so I just pulled out onto instruments and climbed up into the cloud till I got through at about 10,000 feet. When I got up there, I could see one other aeroplane way ahead of me, and I caught him up, then he dived down, I followed him. Who was that? Uh, Johnny Piper. I think, unfortunately, due to lack of training of the pilots, we ran into a certain amount of quite heavy cloud on the way up, and one chap was killed here and another one got to about Warhope, and then a third crashed up past Coffs Harbour, and we landed at Evans Head, the survivors. You were lucky, of course, in that tragic first flight, three planes smashed and mm. two pilots were killed. What chance would you give a squadron that couldn't even fly to Queensland against the Japanese? Well, that's what we wondered. <laughs> no, it, 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 it's pretty obvious that uh, uh, it's not the way you'd uh, prepare for war. When they reached Townsville, there was no time to mourn. No time for an inquest into that tragic loss of two airmen and three aircraft. Here in North Queensland, the schools were closed, the beaches were covered with barbed wire, the civilians were streaming south to escape the predicted Japanese invasion. 75 Squadron was given one week to get its act together one week to learn how to fly the Kitty Hawk properly, to fire its guns, to land it on jungle airstrips. One week to learn the deadly art of aerial warfare. These few scenes, filmed for Australian propaganda purposes, are the only record of those frantic few days of training at Townsville. They try to give the impression that the pilots of the RAAF were full of confidence and itching to mix it with the Japs. In fact, the squadron had been assembled in such a rush that conditions were not much better than a drover's camp. A somewhat camera-shy officer pretends to instruct pilots who pretend to dash off into the wide blue yonder. A crude grass strip had been driven through scrubland on the edge of town just enough runway to get a Kitty Hawk up and down in one piece. We were thrown in as a stopgap. The pilots had very little experience on the Kitty Hawks. Uh, I think I could have had somewhere around seven, hour, seven hours, perhaps. Six hours? I hadn't fired the guns. I know when I first fired the guns in Moresby, the fight of uh, the Tracer, which we were using at the time, mm -hmm. scared me a bit. I'd mm -hmm. never seen Tracer come out. How many hours did you have on the Kitty Hawk before you had to take it north? Oh, three. About eight and a half hours, nine hours thereabouts. Well, we flew around mainly. Oh, we did, we did flew around. We made practice attacks because we had uh, two experienced pilots there who had been in combat. If they could get an aircraft off the ground and get it down safely, that was about as far as it went. I had to look around, you know, looking for the adjutant or somebody to, with a bit of rank. And of all the people there, there wasn't one person who had any badge of rank or anything, any wings, nothing. They all had these funny old hats all battered around and uh, just in khaki. And I thought, now, my God, this, this is going to be a fairly informal crowd. Did you do any saluting? No saluting, no saluting. I met John Jackson whilst I was instructing down at Point Cook. Mm -hmm. He'd come back from the Middle East and he'd probably 
wanted to see just how the younger pilots were uh, operating. I am looking forward to fighting again, especially against the Japanese swine. We'll lick them too. I reckon I can fight 10 times as hard now that our shores are threatened. I've been given 75 squadron and the rank of squadron leader. We expect to be in action in a few days, but it's no joke starting a squadron off from scratch. I'm flat out like a lizard drinking. This is the aeroplane that struck terror into the hearts of Australians in 1942, the Mitsubishi Zero. It destroyed the Allied Air Force in Malaya, it massacred our Wirraways at Rabaul, and it shot up our people and our planes at Darwin. It had complete mastery of the skies over Port Moresby, until, that is, John Jackson and his Kitty Hawks arrived to do battle. The Zero was the most advanced single-seat fighter of its time. It was only half the weight of the Kitty Hawk, which meant that it was much more maneuverable. It could climb faster, fly higher, turn more sharply. As John Jackson drummed into his pilots, never get into a dogfight with a Zero. These Zero pilots in New Guinea in the early months of the war were men with enormous combat experience flying for Japan in the wars against China. This particular machine, V-173, belonged to one of Japan's greatest fighter aces, Saburu Sakai. America, Sorekara, we have totally destroyed the American and the Dutch Air Forces within the region. There was nobody. Then Singapore fell as well, so there were no more enemies. That's why we were told to attack New Guinea. We expected some retaliation from the American and the Australian Air Forces. From the very beginning, our aim was to take over Port Moresby. Our immediate strategy was to establish total control of the skies over Moresby. Of course, the Australian and American forces wanted that control too. Japan had this huge plan. If Port Moresby was easy to take, we were to press onto Townsville in Australia. 